desolate, cold, lonely, windy, and beautiful. This is Antarctica, man's priceless laboratory. This land, almost twice the size of the United States, is the highest continent in the world with an average elevation of 7,000 feet. It is the driest desert continent in the world, less than one half inch of precipitation annually. It's the iciest area in the world. 95% of the world's ice is here. It is the coldest continent. The mean temperature never goes above freezing. For most of the year, the land is locked in by penetrable masses of floating ice. It is the windiest area in the world. Wind velocity averages 15 miles per hour all year with gusts sometimes reaching 200 miles an hour. The world's stormiest seas ring Antarctica. The Antarctic waters are the most abundant in the world, yet Antarctica is the most lifeless of continents. This forsaken land of the most and least has known man for little more than 75 years. Men like Amundsen, Shackleton, and Scott were driven by the adventure of an unexplored area combined with a thirst for scientific knowledge. What kind of scientific knowledge could be found in this wasteland? First of all, the unique geography of Antarctica makes it a great natural laboratory. Here, as at no other spot on Earth, the workings of the upper atmosphere can be studied. The history and secrets of Earth are hidden under the ice. The desolation of this continent where there is little human interference, makes it a lonely but priceless laboratory. But today, this lonely laboratory is under full invasion by man. Scientists from all over the world are being brought by plane and ship to study this land. Specialists of every scientific field are delving into the mysteries of the Antarctic. Expeditions are being supported by the full might of the Navy in a logistics operation of unprecedented magnitude.
As man comes to this strange land, he brings with him the modern conveniences of his own world. Lighting, heating, and fresh water have been brought to the ancient ice with the help of a compact nuclear reactor developed by the Martin Marietta Corporation. Man also brings with him his own peculiar equipment. Like man, the equipment has problems adapting to this land. The engines of these vehicles have to be preheated for an hour or more before starting, even in the summer. But even with the most advanced equipment, the job of finding out of seeking knowledge and answering age-old questions must ultimately be done by man himself. Devoted, dedicated, trained men. From the main Antarctica camps, the men go to their lonely outposts where the scientific data is obtained. In the process of probing and taming the continent, men are gaining more knowledge about man himself. Man's biological and physical systems, under conditions of extreme cold and isolation, are being studied in this unique laboratory. Answers are being found to the questions, what type of clothes to wear, what food to eat, and how to adjust to the cold. It has been determined that given proper nutrition and clothing, man is remarkably adaptable to the cold. One problem that man has yet to conquer on this frozen continent comes from the complete isolation and indescribable loneliness for people and familiar things. These specially selected men must not only fight this isolation, but they must constantly fight the land itself. In addition to the constant fear of snow blindness and frostbite, the men must be prepared for other hazards, such as whiteout condition, when the sky and land blend in a veil of white, making it impossible to distinguish distances and position. So cruel is this land that the very thought of being uncooperative simply does not occur. United States and Russian scientific teams have performed rescues for each other in daring mercy missions. To take full advantage of the scientific knowledge that can be obtained from this laboratory, first, the land must be studied. All but the barest edge of the entire Antarctic continent is still covered by an ice sheet with an average thickness of more than a mile. Glaciologists have found that the volume of ice in the Antarctic is growing at a rate of about 293 cubic miles a year. If the ice should melt, it would raise the sea level enough to flood every major seaport and all the low-lying lands of the Earth. In the Ross Sea, the ice shelf extends as much as 500 miles out from the land over a 400-mile front, an area as large as Spain. The ice cliffs are as high as a 15-story building. The ice caps are a remnant of an ice age that descended upon the Earth a million years ago. Samples taken from the ice reveal centuries of snowfall. The air, pollen and dust trapped in this snow that fell on Antarctica long ago can shed new light on the Earth's history. Detailed information about the land is obtained by traversing across hundreds of miles of treacherous, crevasse-filled ice fields.
Among the many mysteries of Antarctica are the lakes and ponds that never freeze. The water is about 11 times as salty as seawater, almost twice as saline as Utah's Great Salt Lake. Recently, an accidental discovery was made of particular interest to geologists and glaciologists, a huge snow cave. The small entrance gives no indication of the large rooms beyond, comparable to the famous Carlsbad Caverns of New Mexico. One of the most picturesque landmarks is 13,000-foot Mount Erebus, the continent's only live volcano. Mount Erebus lies at the southerly end of a long chain of extinct volcanoes. They reach along the coast of the continent and up the Antarctic Peninsula a stretch of land pointing north to the Cape Horn tip of South America. At one time, it was a single piece of land, a continuation of the Andes Mountains, now submerged in the 600 miles of water between the peninsula and Cape Horn. Antarctica may hold the key to the linking of continents. The theory of continental drift is one explanation for the nearly perfect jigsaw fit of the world's land masses. This theory also reconciles the geology and the paleontology of Antarctica with its isolation at the bottom of the globe. Life at present is extremely limited in this gigantic ice house. Only three flowering plants have been found on the land, an herb and two species of grass. Yet freshwater algae, lichen, fungi and mosses withstand the bitter environment. Mosses have been found growing within 300 miles of the South Pole. The lichens develop with incredible slowness. They may have just one day a year of active growth. It is possible that Antarctica lichens, five inches across, may be the Earth's oldest living things. Unlike the land, the Antarctic waters have possibly the richest plant life in the world. The plankton-filled waters of this region contain three or four times the organic matter of our richest farmlands and woodlands. Scientists in the Antarctic have discovered what appears to be eel larvae four to five feet in length, 20 times larger than the larvae of ordinary eels as we know them. Perhaps these large eels were the sea monsters of ancient history. Killer whales roam the waters like submarine wolf packs. Their favorite pastime is to crash upward through the sea ice to dump unsuspecting penguin flocks into the water. The great whales of the Antarctic seas are the largest creatures ever known to inhabit the Earth, 100 feet long, weighing 150 tons. The 
most abundant animals at the bottom of the earth, aside from birds and fish, are the seals. Since they are air-breathing mammals, they keep blowholes in the sea ice as a means of existing through the long winter. The skua is the most southerly of all birds and one of the most savage. Called the eagle of the Antarctic, he is a prime enemy of the penguin, feeding on their eggs and their young. His fearlessness has sometimes led him into attacking man. Bird banding is one of the many Antarctica scientific projects. Birds are color and number banded in order to follow their migrations and to study their general behavior and life histories. One banded skua in a 10-day trip homed over almost featureless terrain 825 miles to its mate. The most widely known of all the Antarctic animals is the penguin. The penguin spends the entire winter on the ice, feeding on fish and squid. In penguin society, the male incubates the egg, sometimes holding it in his webbed feet for 60 days or more. They can shield the eggs in the face of a 90 mile an hour blizzard. The penguins can frolic for hours in near freezing temperatures, which would quickly kill a man. In extreme cold, penguins are never in danger of freezing to death. Man has a lot to learn from these comedians of the far south. Extensive research is being conducted in Antarctica to help understand the complex interactions of atmosphere, magnetic fields, and solar emanations. Man's understanding of the atmosphere that envelops him is widening through this research in the Antarctic. The ionosphere, the layer that reflects medium and high frequency radio waves, is being thoroughly investigated to find means to improve shortwave radio broadcasting. The Earth's lines of magnetic force leave the globe at one point in one polar region and re-enter at another in the opposite polar region. The north focal point is in Canada, about 100 miles north of Quebec. The other is in Antarctica, at a location only recently attained by man. At these two points, the lines of force are almost vertical. This permits the penetration of cosmic particles, which normally would be deflected at high altitudes in other regions. Low energy cosmic particles in the form of neutrons almost double their equatorial impact rate in the Antarctic. High energy cosmic particles in the form of mesons likewise increase in the Antarctic. Both the high and low energy types of cosmic radiation are clues to the tremendous activity of the universe. They are of obvious importance to the man in space.
Perhaps they're of even greater importance to the man in the street. One theory is that they may even affect hereditary changes by impacting upon germ matter. They may even affect thought processes by striking nerve ends of the brain. Scientific study in the Antarctic is a continuous, never-ending endeavor. Full advantage is taken of any important incident. Solar activity will be at a minimum between July 1964 and July 1965. During this period, which has been designated the International Year of the Quiet Sun, a worldwide magnetic survey will take place. As part of this survey, cosmic rays will be studied at the Douglas Rheometer Station. A rheometer is a device developed for precise measurement of low-level signals in the Antarctic. This research will increase knowledge of the Earth's magnetic and solar activity in the form of flares and sunspots and basic geometric relationships between the Earth and the Sun. In a program under the joint sponsorship of the National Science Foundation and the Douglas Aircraft Company, rheometer systems have been set up to take full advantage of the months of round-the-clock sunlight. They have yielded much valuable information on waves of radio frequency from outside the layers of the Earth's atmosphere. Such research will help determine least dangerous spaceflight launch dates and may provide the foundation for interplanetary communications. Study of Antarctica may answer questions about the structure and history of the Earth. It may result in additions to the world's mineral resources, improvements in radio communications, and more reliable weather forecasts. Further study of the rich marine life may provide the expanding world population with a supermarket of food. Today we are entering an era of unlimited power when science may be able to alter the temperature balance and convert the coal regions to hospitable, productive ones. Under the provisions of the Antarctica Treaty, national claims to territory have been temporarily abandoned. Men of many nations are working together for the good of all. Antarctica has become a laboratory not only for the physical and life sciences, but perhaps most important, a priceless laboratory for the development of international cooperation and understanding.